Thank you very much uh, again for the uh, invitation. Uh, so I'm going to discuss uh, about momentum transport by B waves and uh, and wake, and I'm going to indicate the context under which uh, this uh, study has been contact, um, has been made. Uh, and this uh, uh, study is made by uh, numerical simulation and laboratory experiments, and I would say joint joint one, as you are going to see. So this work has been done with uh, colleagues, my colleague Joel Someria, uh, who was um, responsible for the laboratory experiments, uh, with Bruno Voisin, uh, who is a theoretician uh, working on the internal gravity waves, and with two students, Cruz Garcia Molina, who did his PhD on this topic. And this topic was actually started by a master student, uh, Adekunle uh, Ajayi, so a few, um, a few years ago. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I have a few slides uh, related to uh, the introduction. So first, uh, uh, slide of uh, what is internal gravity waves, if this is uh, needed. So very quickly, uh, I'm considering here a, a stably stratified uh, medium and uh, a fluid particle, uh, which is lifted away from its um, uh, upward, from its uh, uh, um, equilibrium and uh, I would say initial position. So as the particle is lifted in this stably stratified medium, it is subjected to two forces, its weight and uh, the Archimedean drift, the sum of the two being a buoyancy force, which is a restoring force and which would therefore make the fluid particle oscillate. So the existence of a restoring force, this buoyancy force, in a stably stratified medium is at the origin of, of internal gravity waves. Uh, so this is uh, the restoring force of internal gravity waves. As you can see uh, from uh, this simple um, uh, oscillation, um, uh, harmonic oscillator equation, uh, there is a, a frequency uh, which comes uh, into play, which uh, is proportional actually to the density uh, gradient, and uh, n is the brand weisel frequency, and it will be used throughout the, uh, uh, this, uh, this talk. Just very briefly again, uh, the main properties of internal gravity waves, I think the first one is that the dispersion relation of this wave is anisotropic in the sense that uh, the, uh, the frequency of the wave depends upon the, um, the angle which uh, the wave vector or the crop velocity makes uh, with uh, the horizontal or, or vertical. Uh, so um, this is uh, the dispersion relation of the internal gravity wave, n is the brand weisel frequency. Uh, this is, uh, so when uh, the restoring force is the buoyancy, then this corresponds to this first uh, term, n square sine square theta. But there can also be another restoring force in a rotating medium, which is the Coriolis force. And the contribution of the Coriolis force results in this second term here. F is the Coriolis parameter, which is due to the Earth rotation. So um, this peculiar uh, property, I would say, uh, an isotropic property of internal gravity wave results in the fact that the crop velocity uh, is perpendicular. The crop velocity is perpendicular uh, uh, to the wave vector. So this is a famous uh, laboratory experiment performed by Mowbray and, uh, and, and, and Rarity uh, in uh, the non-rotating context. And uh, I indicated here briefly, uh, I mean, what can be seen on the, um, what can be seen on the figure. So um, the uh, second important properties is that the structure of internal gravity waves depends upon their source. Uh, if the source is oscillating, like here, so I'm going to actually briefly describe, describe this. So in this uh, Mowbray and Rarity experiment, you have a horizontal cylinder uh, which oscillates vertically in a stably stratified medium. What you see here is a, a vertical view, uh, I, I can say, of the density fluctuation. So the vertical bar here is actually the cylinder support and the cylinder is perpendicular to the figure. So uh, the crop velocity, uh, which is uh, uh, the velocity with which, at which uh, the energy uh, is uh, transported by, by the wave, uh, is um, uh, along four direction here uh, called uh, beams. So uh, this is exactly what you uh, see here. Of course, this is the same figure. So for an oscillating source, the waves propagate as beam, but if the wave is steady, uh, such for, uh, which is the case for uh, when there is a uniform wind over topography, then the waves do not propagate as beams in this case. So this is an illustration of this situation taken from this paper. You have a, a current which flows over this um, half sphere, and uh, you clearly see that there is a wave structure. It's not a beam in the sense that there is not this multiple uh, structure, if I can say, uh, from which you see in the Mubro and Rarity experiment. The, I would say the very difference is that in the frame of reference attached to the topography, to the source, in the sense that 
uh, I would say the source of energy is of course the wind, but uh, there is a wind blowing uh, over this topography. So in the frame of reference attached to the topography, the waves are steady um, in this absolute reference frame. By contrast, in this uh, Mobrain rarity experiments, the, uh, the frequency of the wave is that of the source. So uh, this um, steady wave, uh, for the case of a, a wind blowing of a topography, are called Lee waves, and these are the waves uh, we uh, will be interested in. So, um, um, so we spoke about internal gravity waves, uh, and I'm going to discuss about them in the oceanic context. So the first question is, uh, why are internal gravity waves of interest in the ocean? Well, what you see here is a sketch of the so-called meridional overturning circulation in the ocean due to the fact that at high latitudes, at certain locations, the, um, the, water, uh, the water sinks down to the bottom of the ocean and uh, due to mass conservation, this water is slowly uh, coming back to the surface following a rather complex uh, pathway, uh, if I can say path, uh, which is indicated here. So um, the raising of these uh, water masses when they are at the bottom of the ocean, so these deep water, mas uh, water masses, occurs through turbulent processes and mixing. This was shown in this uh, paper by, by Monk in 1966. Then it was guessed in 1998 by Monk and Vench that very likely these mixing processes in the ocean interior are mainly contributed by internal gravity waves. And there is a beautiful paper, I would say, there were many, many scientists, I would say, all uh, uh, oceanographers in the US plus uh, colleagues elsewhere, but the, the heart is made of, um, I mean, uh, US uh, oceanographers. There is a beautiful paper where they show that indeed uh, these mixing processes in the ocean interior uh, are contributed by, by internal gravity waves. So starting from the paper of Munch and Wunsch, uh, Munch and Wunsch, Munch, Munch and Wunsch, more than 20 years ago, uh, there started to be a very strong interest in oceanic uh, internal gravity waves. So the first question uh, people were asked is, uh, uh, what are the main sources of internal gravity waves in the ocean? So um, there were three main sources, actually. The first one, if I can say, is the barotropic tide passing over uh, topography. Uh, and the internal gravity waves which, uh, which is generated in this case is called uh, the internal tide. And uh, it, it has been estimated from, in particular, from um, uh, satellite, uh, I mean, altimeter data, but not only from that as well, uh, I mean, uh, uh, using uh, a numerical modeling and uh, uh, theoretical uh, consideration, that uh, 25 to 30 percent of the barotropic tide energy is lost to internal, to internal wave. And this, is, this occurs when the tide has to go over the bathymetry. That is, and this occurs so at mid-ocean ridges and continental slopes. The second sources of internal gravity wave in the ocean uh, is due to the wind uh, blowing at the surface of the ocean. So this seems to be strange, but uh, uh, the wind at the surface of the ocean generates mainly so-called inertial oscillations, which are internal gravity waves with frequency equal to this Coriolis frequency due to, uh, to the Earth rotation. And uh, it was shown uh, theoretically that uh, this, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the energy of uh, these inertial oscillations is able to propagate down to the bottom of the ocean. Very briefly, here this is a, uh, so this is a depth time over four months. Uh, so this is a record. Uh, so from the sea surface made by, um, um, I mean, oceanographers, and this come from this paper. Uh, by Matthew Alford. Uh, so this is the um, uh, horizontal component of the, um, uh, of the current in the ocean, which is filtered out uh, into inertial oscillation, so this is the second frame, and into uh, internal tide. So you clearly see that there were inertial oscillations down to the bottom of the ocean or down to the measurements, which, which is at 3,000 meters. The second third, uh, the third source should not maybe try to go too fast. The third source of um, uh, internal gravity waves in the ocean uh, was discovered much much more recently, I would say uh, at the end uh, of the last millennium, so 1999, 2000, something like this. Uh, the first papers uh, mentioning that uh, started to, um, uh, to be published. It 
the flowing of sub-inertial motions of a rough bathymetry. Uh, sub-inertial means uh, from a practical or I would say mainly, they are mainly contributed by the Antarctic circumpolar current, which is flowing over Antarctica, as well as geostrophic motions. And uh, the point is that uh, these motions, when they, they hit, if I can say, when they pass at the bottom uh, of the ocean, uh, when this uh, um, bottom topography is very rough, these generate lee waves uh, exactly as when the wind is blowing over a mountain. So it was discovered that in the ocean there are also lee waves, but uh, most importantly, uh, that they, they can contribute in an important manner, I'm going to show that on the next slide, to mixing in the ocean. So let, let, let me just say first that it was shown uh, by this paper by Nico Rachin and Ferrari that 50% of the flux of energy in the leeway field is in the Southern Ocean. So uh, briefly as well, it was shown in these uh, three, uh, in these two papers, that actually these three, uh, uh, I would say, uh, the three types of internal gravity wave due to the tide, due to the wind, and due to this geostrophic motion passing of a rough topography, uh, have uh, uh, contribute uh, in a similar manner uh, to, uh, to mixing. Uh, in, in the ocean and the power trans transferred from their source are indicated here. There is, of course, a large amount of a certainty, but uh, you can see that the, these uh, three numbers are, uh, are uh, uh, similar. So, uh, so I'm going to, uh, uh, to um, consider uh, the last, I would say, source of uh, internal gravity waves in the, in the ocean, which is the interaction of a current with a topography. So I'm going to consider that, as you could guess from the title, in a very idolized manner. Uh, yet, I think it was useful to, uh, to show the context. So regarding the bibliography on, on that topic, uh, there has been work, of course, done both without rotation, uh, that is considering ignoring uh, the um, effect of Earth rotation, as well as with rotation. Uh, this work, as you can see here, we are mainly done through numerical simulation, 2D1, in an atmospheric context, as well as, uh, so I, I mentioned the paper by Vosper, but there has been papers by Vosper and colleagues and other papers. Uh, and uh, uh, there has been uh, work done also uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, three-dimensional uh, numerical simulations. And this is a beautiful illustration here of a paper by Maxime Nikoachin. Uh, the purpose, actually, of this paper uh, was uh, uh, to, um, to estimate uh, the rate among other, uh, uh, I would say, analysis of kinetic energy dissipation due to the uh, uh, geostrophic current passing of a very rough uh, topography. And one key result, I would say, is that uh, looking again at this uh, dissipation rate of kinetic energy, you can see that uh, this uh, rate can be important up uh, to the, the surface that is over the whole fluid column. Uh, and hence, and uh, since the, uh, the, the source uh, of um, uh, the source of, of mixing, or the mixing is due to breaking lee waves. I mean, this was a way to uh, uh, to stress the importance of this process uh, in in the ocean. Um, there has been very little um, uh, laboratory experiments, as you can see here, uh, which were 2D. And uh, in this work, I'm going to uh, discuss about three-dimensional uh, laboratory experiments done without rotation and uh, with rotation, which can be considered as being the first laboratory experiments performed uh, on that topic. So um, I'm interested in um, mixing um, in the ocean. Uh, I'm not going to discuss about mixing in the ocean uh, because uh, the study I will uh, uh, present is an idolized uh, one. Yet, I, I should say, I'm interested in, in the source of energy dissipation uh, when a current uh, interacts with a topography. So there can be two sources, basically, either by breaking lee waves in the fluid column, and this is, for instance, illustrated here in the atmosphere, and uh, or um, when the, um, uh, and I'm going to discuss that more precisely, but uh, uh, so when the current is going over topography, lee waves are emitted. But uh, if I uh, would say the fluid particles, some fluid particles do not have enough kinetic energy to go over uh, the mountain, then the, the current is going around the mountain, then there is a wake. 
uh, forming behind the mountain and this wake can be turbulent and for instance this is a beautiful illustration here of a wake in the atmosphere again uh, um, i mean behind an island so there are two sources of um, um, energy dissipation and the purpose of this work is is, is to try to um, to start i would say to um, uh, compare to estimate and to comp and to compare these uh, sources of energy uh, uh, dissipation or the uh, the energy dissipation uh, i would say associated with uh, uh, each of these sources so more precisely in this talk uh, we focus on, on the flow which is produced by a current of a simple topography and this will be a hemisphere uh, in a stably stratified rotating medium so I'm first going to analyze the structure of the Lee wave and of the wake created by the current, uh, compare the momentum flux transported by the wave and the wake, and then very briefly, hopefully will I have time to do that, I would like to show just a few slides of what has happened from an experimental point of view in the rotating case, where you do not consider only a single hemisphere, but, but multiple hemispheres. So uh, I need again to uh, say just a few words on, on, on Lee waves uh, in order to, uh, for the understand, for the remainder hopefully to be uh, clear. Uh, so uh, there is a very uh, simple uh, textbook, I would say, situation of Lee waves emission by the by a, a uniform uh, uh, wind uh, passing the topography with a, a uniform value of n as well. I said already that the wave is steady uh, with respect to the topography. The, I said, uh, so I did not say that yet, but uh, if the waves are considered now in a frame of reference attached to the wind, then they are propagating and their frequency is equal to kx times u. So this is something we shall see again very often. Maybe I could have uh, written omega sub r or for relative uh, frequency. And for, uh, um, for an, uh, I would say, when the topography uh, is a sinusoidal, this k sub x is given uh, by the um, wave number associated with the topography. Um, using the fact that omega is equal to kxu for Lie waves, and using the dispersion relation as well, one can infer that the modulus of k is equal to n divided by u. So it's set by, I would say, external parameters. And this was shown a long time ago, as you can see. The second point I would like to stress, because this is important for the uh, remainder, is that uh, the wave regime is linear if uh, this parameter, u divided by nh, which, I'm, which is a fruit number, is greater than 1. Physically, what does it mean? This can be written as u divided by n much smaller than h, where h is the height of the mountain, height of the topography, u and n, u, you understood what this is. And this inequality here means that the vertical distance a fluid particle can travel vertically, u divided by n, is much larger than the height of the mountain. So we have the curious situation where we have a fruit number, which, is, which has to be very large, much larger than one, for the wave regime to be linear. And so in the way this fruit number is, is defined. Um, uh, okay, so there is still one puzzle point, maybe, is that uh, if u goes uh, to zero, if uh, the wind uh, becomes of the current, we are in the ocean, becomes very small, then uh, the fruit number uh, can't be much smaller, larger, larger than one, and yet uh, it's difficult to imagine that when u goes to zero, the flow regime can become non-linear. So this uh, contradiction is waived by the concept of dividing streamline, and uh, which is very easily uh, illustrated here by the drawing I, I made in a very crude manner, but it's, it's, it's easy to, uh, to understand. So you have a mountain there, and uh, uh, if uh, the um, velocity, the, if the speed, I would say, of the current is, is not enough, and I'm going to make this more precise afterwards. This means that a part only uh, of the flow will be able to go over uh, the mountain and the remainder, uh, the flow um, uh, close, closer to the bottom uh, of the topography, bottom of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the ocean, we'd say, will go around the topography. 
So one can really imagine that there is a, uh, uh, so these lines here are supposed to be streamlines, that there is a so-called dividing streamline, dividing the region of the flow where uh, the, the current is able to go over the topography from the region where it is not able to do so and therefore is going around the topography. So it, it's not difficult again from a qualitative point of view to estimate the height of the dividing streamline as measured from the top of the topography. As previously, this is actually uh, the, um, uh, the largest distance a fluid particle, so let us consider a fluid particle located on at the dividing streamline, the largest distance it can travel up to the top of the topography, which, which is u divided by n, has to be equal to h sub s, the, the height of this dividing streamline. Um, um, uh, I would say because it is located on the dividing streamline. So, um, uh, so I should have read that sentence, I think it would have been uh, clear. But uh, this fluid particle here, uh, the vertical distance it can travel, u divided by n, is equal to h sub s, and this defines the height of the, divine, uh, of the dividing streamline. So um, it's uh, straightforward to show that h sub s divided by capital H, again the height of the mountain, namely uh, is equal to u divided by nh, from where we infer that the height of the dividing streamline, again as measured uh, uh, from uh, this uh, uh, up to the uh, top of the mountain divided by h is equal to the fluid number. Uh, and therefore, a dividing streamline will exist for a fluid number smaller than one. So uh, this um, leads to the fact that when u is actually goes to zero, then uh, there is a dividing streamline whose position gets closer and closer to the top uh, of the mountain as u gets uh, smaller. We also infer from the definition of the dividing streamline that uh, a wave field is emitted above the dividing streamline and uh, there is a, a wave field which forms behind the topography um, below uh, the dividing streamline. So what I would like to, uh, to do briefly now is to um, uh, present uh, the laboratory experiments and uh, even more briefly the uh, numerical uh, uh, simulation. So um, the laboratory experiments were, were performed uh, on the Coriolis platform in Grenoble, which is a huge, I would say, rotating platform, diameter 30 meter. Uh, so there was a, a hemisphere, a topography, hemispheric topography of high 20 uh, centimeter, uh, which was located, uh, as you can see, uh, on the platform, uh, far, of course, uh, from the uh, boundary, far from the wall and far uh, from the center. Uh, and uh, um, the, the current was created by a spin-up of the, of, of the tank over a short time from rest in the non-rotating case, going to present both rotating and non-rotating configuration, and from solid body rotation in the rotating case. The measurements uh, were made, uh, as is classical in this um, uh, stable stratified uh, medium, by a horizontal laser sheet, but there were also vertical scan, which allows to get the uh, horizontal velocity at different uh, uh, altitudes from nearly the, uh, the bottom of the tank up to uh, 60 centimeters. Uh, the height of the fluid layer in the tank is one meter. And uh, um, so this um, horizontal laser sheet were there in order to illuminate fluid particles whose uh, position we are next recorded, we are next detected by uh, so-called uh, uh, particle image velocimetry, uh, by uh, I would say particle image velocimetry uh, uh, software. Uh, so this is easy to do, not easy, and this is easy to say, I would say, and not at all easy to do, especially since, uh, uh, especially if uh, you want to get the, uh, uh, the velocity of the fluid particle uh, with a very good precision. Just to say here that, uh, uh, because of uh, 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 horizontal laser sheet were, uh, were used, only the horizontal component of the velocity field could be measured, and W, the vertical component, was recovered from continuity equation. Uh, this implies also that uh, the velocity and the horizontal gradient of the horizontal velocity component should be detected, uh, I would say, precisely enough in order to be able to, to use the continuity equation to, uh, to recover W. So I would say it's, it's not, I repeat again, it's not an easy task at all. Uh, but you may, this, uh, you may know this already. 
So what are the experimental parameters? Uh, so very um, briefly, uh, these are the uh, experimental parameters in the laboratory and uh, the corresponding uh, parameters uh, in the ocean. The lab was uh, experiments were conceived um, to reproduce, I mean, uh, oceanic um, uh, situation using in particular the, the paper, uh, the papers by um, uh, 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 Nico Rashin and, and Ferrari. Uh, what I would like to stress is that the buoyancy frequency n is constant. The, uh, there will be a, a non-rotating case, f equal to zero, and a rotating case, f divided by n is equal to zero four. So this will be simple when I will say rotation and not rotation. And I'm going to, uh, to consider three values of the fruit number, two values being smaller than one, if you remember. So there is a dividing streamline in this situation and a value of F larger uh, than one, implying that the whole flow is able to go over the topography. There is nearly no wake. And, and therefore no dividing streamline in this case. And uh, just for information, the uh, current velocity, the values are associated associated with this fruit number are indicated here. So just remember, but I'm going to say it, when the fruit number increases, this corresponds to U, uh, uh, which uh, increases. Uh, I'm not sure I have so much time to show this, so I'm going to, uh, uh, to skip that. So for the numerical model, so this is a three-dimensional numerical model. Uh, there will be a forcing of the flow at the left boundary. No slip boundary condition at the bottom boundary. Well, clearly does not correspond to the uh, uh, situation of the laboratory experiments. But as we are going to see, the comparison is quite reasonable between numerical and laboratory experiments. Uh, and uh, the resolution is not very high, only one centimeter. Uh, along the three direction, but we have been doing a uh, simulation with half uh, that um, uh, resolution along the vertical. Okay, so I'm going to present result now, but the non-rotating configuration. So first, let us address the structure of the wave field. So what is plotted here is the vertical velocity in a vertical plane during the steady regime when the Lee wave, um, after having been formed, uh, are steady. Of course, there is a transient regime where uh, you trigger, I would say, uh, the current, the leeway forms, and then they are steady. So we are in this regime. These are results from the numerical simulation for the three value of the fruit number, about one, if you remember, that we consider. What do we see? So the key points, I would say, are indicated here. First, uh, the dividing streamline is indicated with a red line, so it decreases. If I decrease it, it, it gets closer uh, to the bottom of the domain as the fruit number increases, is indicated here. What we see is that waves are emitted above the dividing streamlines in all three situations. We also observed that they are emitted with a well-defined wavelength. And the wavelength which I, I indicated here with a white line uh, is uh, the distance between, say, the center of this uh, red uh, pattern, if I say crudely. Uh, so we see that indeed, as U increases, the wavelength increases. Yeah, this is, uh, appears very uh, clearly. Um, and uh, uh, so um, uh, it can also be shown that uh, one over uh, lambda, that is, or two pi divided by lambda, which is the modulus of the uh, wave vector, of the Lie waves is equal to n divided by u. This satisfies uh, which corresponds to the prediction of long, of long, but it is straightforward to, uh, to show that. It's the reason for which uh, this was shown a long time ago and long did many much more, I would say, sophisticated and uh, uh, I mean, elaborated uh, development on, the, uh, on Lie waves. Okay, so this is what we see here, but we have no information of what does set the angle actually of um, of, uh, of a. Uh, let, let me say that in these Lee waves, the crop velocity uh, is uh, a perpendicular to this uh, black line, and uh, this black, black line is the direction of the wave vector, as actually indicated by uh, the representation of, uh, of lambda here. The second point uh, when addressing the structure of the wave field I would like to, to show is uh, the um, uh, comparison between laboratory experiments, the 3D numerical simulation regarding the, the wavelengths. And uh, we also did a linear uh, calculation 
um, taking into, into account the dividing streamline. So it's not um, uh, the, theory, uh, the theory of Bruno Voisin, uh, which he, against which we also compare these results. So I choose here not to present uh, his results. These are simply uh, linear uh, calculation inferred uh, by uh, solving uh, theoretically uh, I would say uh, the uh, linear uh, Buzinesque equation for the hemisphere. So at the very end, what you have to do is a Fourier transform. So this is done uh, with uh, some Python or MATLAB program. But I mean, the derivation it itself is very simple and theoretical. So um, uh, this is for the fruit number equal to uh, 0 0.31. Let me uh, say and show uh, that uh, there is a good agreement between the wavelengths uh, found uh, from the laboratory experiments and those in this 3D numerical simulation and the linear calculation with the dividing streamline. If you do not take the dividing streamline in the linear calculation, then uh, the wavelength is okay, but the amplitude is, is, is not uh, okay at all. So uh, this is for uh, the fruit number equal to 0 0.62. We have a good agreement again. We clearly see uh, you know, more precisely that the wavelength increases and U increases and the same when the fruit number is equal to 1.25. We're still a reasonable approach, I would say, with the wavelength measured from the PIV um, uh, analysis of the lab experiments and um, uh, the other uh, uh, approaches. Now, uh, I would like to uh, discuss about the flux of energy uh, of the waves or the, um, the energy transported uh, by the Lee waves. So, um, uh, you know that uh, for Lee waves, uh, this, um, uh, the flux of energy is equal to P prime, W prime, see the uh, pressure deviation with respect to hydrostatic balance. So, what is done, in he what is done here is a spectrum along the X direction the direction of the current of P prime W prime. And uh, there is an average uh, along the Y direction where in the steady regime, so no need, no need to do anything in time, it's steady. Uh, but uh, we have to say that this is at 23 centimeter, that is just above the height of the hemisphere whose height is 20 centimeter. What do we see? This is a spectrum and we see that there is a very clear peak and that this peak uh, is actually uh, uh, at the same value of, uh, of lambda, uh, so this is a spectrum versus one over L, but we don't care. This corresponds to 44 centimeter. So we see that the spectrum peaks at the same value for lambda x, and this is a spectrum along the x direction, as detected from the wave structure. So um, <clears throat> what we infer from that is that the horizontal wavelengths, um, which uh, we found um, in all three approaches for Lee waves is therefore the scale at which the flux of energy uh, is maximum. And uh, uh, because um, modulus of k is equal to n divided by u, uh, since lambda x is set uh, by the scale at which the flux energy is maximum, this is actually what does set uh, the angle of the wave vector with the horizontal. And since this value of k sub x is selected like this, this also selects, sets the wave frequency, which is equal to uh, kx u. Now I talk about the flux of energy of the Lie waves. Uh, I would like now to discuss about the momentum flux of the Lie waves. And if you remember, one objective is to compare the momentum flux of the Lie wave of the wake in the rotating and non-rotating case. So um, let me uh, remind again that uh, uh, when, in, when Lee waves are um, emitted by a wind, by a current passing over topography, this results in a drag force exerted on the topography. And it is usually said that the topography exerts uh, a force on, on the flow, which is, of course, by the law of action and reaction, uh, equal and opposite to this um, drag force. The expression of this drag force per unit mass uh, is equal to minus u prime w prime. u prime w prime is the momentum flux and this is the vertical transport of horizontal momentum and this quantity is, is positive. Uh, in the present case, we computed d at 23 uh, uh, centimeter. Um, in order to be able to compare uh, the different uh, uh, cases, configuration, 
So it is very standard in uh, fluid mechanics, as you know, uh, to build a non-dimensional parameter, uh, which is called uh, the drag coefficient, which is defined by uh, the ratio of the drag force by the surface facing the current times one half of the square of the speed of the current. So in the present case, it is important to consider for S the surface above the dividing streamline, which is the surface indeed, which is seen by the current which emits the wave. So um, we computed this uh, CD prime. Um, I should have written CD prime. We computed this um, uh, CD prime for the three uh, fruit number. We consider the three values of uh, the current, speed current. We consider three, six, and, and 12 uh, centimeter per second. And uh, this corresponds to the blue dot here. So let me first explain what is this curve. So as you can see, this is a drag coefficient as a function of the fruit number. So this is a, a picture taken from Bruno Voisin. And uh, what is indicated, what is reported here are results from laboratory experiments of, in terms of Lee waves uh, emitted by a current, by a wind, by a flow, passing over topography. And uh, as you can see, there are a certain number of, uh, of laboratory uh, experiment. The, the line here uh, are, are fit and uh, there is a theoretical uh, result, I think, uh, in, in, the, in the situation of a, a large uh, fruit number. So what we see is that uh, the blue value, I would say our blue value, the CD coefficient for Lie waves, I would say superpose reasonably well uh, on this curve. So uh, clearly there is a good agreement. Now, uh, let me say a few words of uh, why this curve uh, displays a maximum. Actually, uh, we first consider the small value of the fruit number. So when the fruit number um, is small, we know that uh, uh, when it increases, the dividing streamlines get closer and closer to the bottom, and therefore the surface which is uh, in front, which is offered, if I can say, uh, which uh, the, the current sees, sees increases, uh, implying that uh, the drag force will increase and therefore the CD will increase as well. So we can understand that. Now I'm going to consider the opposite case of a fruit number, which is very large. Uh, in this situation, when the fruit number is very large, uh, let me remind you that omega the intrinsic wave frequency, that is uh, the frequency of the wave in a frame of reference attached to the current, which is equal to kxu, it is upper bounded by n. Now, this is a property of internal gravity waves. It comes from the dispersion relation of these internal gravity waves. Therefore, when the fruit number increases, namely when u increases, because omega can't exceed n necessarily, k sub x has to decrease. The wavelength of the wave, has, of the Lie wave, has to decrease. And it can be shown in this case that when kx goes to zero, the wave amplitude decreases. And since the momentum flux is proportional to the square of the wave amplitude, we infer that the drag force decreases and so does as well the CD. So indeed, the CD, when the fruit number is very large, goes to zero. So since it increases when the fruit number is small, and uh, goes to zero when the fruit number uh, is, becomes very large, then necessarily then there is a maximum position somewhere. And what you can see is that the fruit number of 0 0.62 in the present case corresponds to the um, configuration where the uh, drag force is, uh, is maximum. The drag force associated with the Lie waves is maximum. Now, I would like to um, discuss briefly about the structure of the wave field. So what is plotted here is the horizontal cross-section of uh, the velocity fluctuations. So total velocity minus uh, the current normalized by U during the steady regime. For the three value of the fruit number we consider, not surprisingly, we see that there is a strong wake uh, when the fruit number is equal to 0 3, which decreases and is nearly inexistent when the fruit number is larger than uh, uh, larger than 1, because again, the flow is the whole flow is able to go over the uh, uh, topography. And there is no, um, I would say, in this situation, we are in a laminar uh, regime. Uh, so um, it's the simple case. Um, this is again the structure of, uh, of the wake field. 
uh, and but seen now just in a slightly different manner uh, from the vertical vorticity component. Previously, it was the velocity, horizontal velocity fluctuations. Uh, so this is another quantity which I saw, which is uh, more appropriate actually to characterize the wake. And as you can see, I compare the numerical simulation now with the laboratory experiments. So unfortunately here, uh, there has been no, um, it was not possible to uh, compute the, um, vertical, uh, the vertical vorticity. What do we see? Well, we see that in the laboratory experiments, the, um, uh, the wake is turbulent uh, as expected, but it's fairly straight. Um, let me say it like this. It will be completely different when you will add rotation. Uh, in the numerical simulation, well, there is a wake as well, of course, but uh, it is laminar, much more laminar than uh, in the laboratory experiments, implying that diffusion is uh, higher in the numerical simulation than in the laboratory experiment. And of course, when the fruit number is greater than one, there is nearly uh, no wake. So uh, let me now compare the drag coefficients of the wave and of the wake. So I'm not going to explain how the drag coefficient of the wake is computed. This is indicated here. Let me just say that we consider, we compute the total drag in a domain which surrounds uh, the uh, topography and uh, we subtract from this total drag the uh, uh, drag associated with the wave from which we get the drag associated with the wake. So the results are there. So this is again the CD, the drag, as a function of our three, three fruit number, if you remember, 0, 3, 62, 125. The, the wave is in blue, the wake uh, is in, in red. Not much to say, I would say here, we, uh, we have this uh, bell shape, if I can say, uh, form uh, the bell shape behavior for the uh, CD uh, of, of the wave explained previously. And the wake, while well, it decreases uh, the, uh, uh, the, the wake importance, the wake amplitude and extent uh, decreases, the fruit number increases, so consistently the, the drag uh, uh, decreases uh, and decreases as well. So I would like to um, uh, speak, of course, about uh, trying to be a little fast about the uh, rotating uh, uh, situation now. So I'm going to compare the rotating and non-rotating case uh, for a few um, uh, for a few elements, I would say. So first, this is the vertical velocity w in a vertical plane, and these are result from the numerical simulations. Yeah. Comparison with the lab experiments is in the next slide. For the smallest, smallest value of the fruit number we consider in the, uh, for the no uh, rotation, uh, no, rota no rotation case and uh, the rotation case. So um, uh, no rotation is here, rotation is here. Well, what do we see? Uh, it's very similar. We find that there is a well-defined wavelength in both cases. I put in italic what I do not show on the slides. And uh, it can be shown that both on the non-rotating and rotating case, this wavelength is actually the one for which the flux of energy is maximum. So I say whatever f divided by n, of course, this is accelerate. Yeah, that, that is, this is valid for f divided by n equal to 0 or 0 to 4. We show that this wavelength increases with the fr. We also show that in the rotating case, the intensity of w is weaker uh, than in the non-rotating case. And uh, the reason for that is that in this rotating case, there is now a V component, which has the same amplitude as U. So if you want the, the energy uh, of the source, which is transported by the wave, is now uh, spread into three components, U, V, and W. So instead of propagating nearly vertically, the waves now are fully uh, three-dimensional. And hence the fact that in the W uh, component, uh, the, um, uh, the, um, the amplitude, I would say, of this component is, uh, uh, is lower. Now, it, uh, it is shown also that rotation makes the beam inclination to be closer to the uh, horizontal, and there has been a theoretical development made by Rudderkopf, uh, as you can see, a, a long time ago, uh, which explains uh, this, uh, this behavior. So, uh, this is again the structure uh, this is not a game. Here it was the structure of the wave field. Now this is the structure of the wake field. In French it's better because we have onde et sillage, so the words are very different. In English, um, 
um, uh, uh, quite unusually, I would say, it's less convenient than, than French. So um, what is plotted here are a horizontal cross-section close to the bottom boundary of the vertical vorticity. Again, the rotation, rotation, laboratory experiments and numerical simulation for the smallest, uh, smallest value of the fruit number we consider. Uh, so what do we see? So we found that previously, and this is uh, the non-rotating case. So in the rotating case, we see now that uh, there is a turbulent wake, and there was a turbulent wake previously, but now with a von Kármán street, and uh, there is even a periodic uh, vortex shedding, uh, um, both for uh, the fruit number equal to 0 0.31 and uh, 0 0.62, so for the fruit number smaller than 1, and uh, my colleagues uh, computed the Struhl number, which they found equal to 0 0.2, which is the Struhl number associated with vortex shredding by a cylinder, vortex shedding by a cylinder. Um, there is also a vortex shedding in the numerical simulation, but uh, Again, the flow is much more um, uh, laminar uh, and uh, of slightly weaker amplitude, consistent with the fact that, uh, I mean, fan, 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 numerical, I don't think, uh, the diffusion is a little too high in, uh, in the numerical simulation. So uh, I present here the drag coefficients of the, of the wave and of the wake, as I did it uh, for the case with no rotation. So um, uh, what do we see in this situation? Well, we recover more or less the bell, sh bell shape for the wave blue uh, drag coefficient, though um, uh, we see that uh, for the fruit number is larger than one, uh, actually the, uh, the, um, the drag coefficient of the wave is not as low uh, as uh, it were in the non-rotating case. And uh, we also found that when the fruit number uh, is equal to 1.25, greater than 1, Actually, there is still a wake uh, which uh, remains, um, which uh, remains and leads to a drag coefficient which is no longer equal to zero. I present this result because I think it's important to present the non-rotating versus the rotating case. But we are currently checking uh, this result, uh, especially when the fruit number is uh, is um, uh, greater than one. So uh, this is a little complicated, but here I'm just comparing the rotating case, and round corresponds to a rotating case, with respect to the non-rotating case, a star, for the wake, red, and wave case. So, um, uh, so I said previously uh, what we could conclude uh, for the rotating case, and what can be added now when we compare the rotating and non-rotating case, is that the drag coefficient for the wake, which are in red here, would be reinforced by rotation effects and we uh, and we see that uh, when there is a, a rotation um, and i'm lost with uh, we say so uh, when there is a rotation for the wake uh, the cd with rotation is here without rotation is nearly equal to zero and um, um, voila and uh, uh, this is what can be concluded from this figure, but again, I, uh, we are currently checking this uh, and this result, and uh, the methodology is there, and uh, um, this will be fully correct in the paper uh, we are currently uh, writing. And so we are checking this result to be, uh, of course, uh, sure uh, about what we uh, about what we say. Uh, so um, just uh, during a few minutes, I, I would like to uh, show you the results experimental results, uh, both the case of multiple mountains. So uh, my colleagues have placed uh, uh, 18 mountain at the bottom of the Coriolis platform. So in this situation, what we found, as opposed to the case of only one uh, hemisphere, uh, that uh, there are inertial oscillations, uh, as uh, can be seen here, and which are dominant. They are dominant, actually, their amplitude is about one tenth of the amplitude of, of the current. This is the first uh, thing to notice. And the second point, the last result I would like to show, is that, uh, so this concerns again only the laboratory experiments, no rotation, with rotation. So what is plotted here is, um, um, uh, what is plotted here is actually uh, Z, the, um, um, velocity, horizontal uh, velocity, U, uh, which is recorded at different altitude above 
the bottom boundary. As you can see, 10 centimeters, 13 centimeters. So we are there uh, in, in the wake. So there is a <clears throat> friction and turbulent friction, which result in the fact that uh, this mean velocity decays. I should say, as written here, that this mean velocity, so it is measured in a small volume, but most importantly, it is measured at two meters away from the last hemispheres, and there were 18, a group of 18 hemispheres, to avoid local effects. So um, the point to stress when there is no rotation is that in the wake, uh, there is turbulent friction, which results in the decay of the mean velocity. But when you are outside the wake, um, and uh, I would say above the topography, uh, there are waves, inertial waves, but these inertial waves do not um, uh, do anything, I would say, uh, to the mean velocity in the same that they do not perturb at all the mean velocity because the amplitude is, is very weak. The key point, of course, to stress in this uh, slide is the fact that when there is rotation, as you can see, now the velocity uh, decay, whatever the height at which you measure uh, this velocity. So uh, this implies that uh, the bottom friction uh, can be shown that this uh, slope here uh, in the, uh, behind the topography is uh, similar to this one. So uh, this implies that the bottom friction is efficiently transferred uh, to the whole water column. And uh, we have ideas of what, of why we could be, uh, this could be so, but uh, 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 this needs to be uh, uh, checked, I would say, and further verified. Okay, so if I if I conclude briefly, so as you understood, uh, I uh, study and uh, we study uh, the structure and the momentum flux of the Lee wave and N wake uh, produced by a current pa passing over the hemispheric topography. We did this using a three D numerical simulation and laboratory experiments uh, for a parameter regime which was around. Fr equal one, and you, had just, you understood why it was interesting to consider this flow regime, yeah? because we go from a situation where there is a dividing streamline to a situation where there is not, situation where there is a wake, an important wake, to a situation where there is none. So the main result is that there is a well-defined wavelength, whether we are with rotation or no rotation, that the frequency of the Lee wave. Uh, actually the horizontal wavelength, but we can say the frequency of the Lee wave as well, is selected by the wave energy flux to be maximum at that frequency. Uh, we found that the drag coefficient of the wave is in agreement with past laboratory experiments, and this corresponds to this bell shape I showed. With rotation, we found that the wave amplitude is reduced. There is a vortex shedding in the, in the wake, uh, and uh, we found comparable values of the drag coefficient with the wave and the wake for uh, the fruit number smaller than one. And as I, as I said, uh, we are, um, I think we, found we need to check this. Um, so we'll, uh, with multiple hemispheres with rotation, we found that the decay, there is a decay of the mean current in the whole fluid column, which shows that bottom friction is efficiently transferred uh, to the whole water column. And we need to, uh, uh, figure out or make it more precise uh, the physical mechanism uh, under this um, behavior.